My name is Dana Morris Dixon, and I'm an assistant general manager at the Jamaica National Group. Um, before that, I worked in the public sector in the prime minister's office and at JAMPRO, and I'm also a former academic having lectured at the University of the West Indies. And my role today is to facilitate this session. And I take my role really to be to get us to some policy outcomes at the end of all of this. So we're going to be together for an hour and a half. And what I'm expecting is that at the end of that hour and a half, that we will be able to say to the plenary and also to the, organiz the organizers, this is how we view economic resilience. And this is these are some of the policy prescriptions that we have discussed in this group and are proposing as um, the way forward. So I'm going to start very quickly with um, a presentation, just setting the stage um, for this discussion around resilience. And I'm not going to be um, going for very long, uh, so I'm just going to go straight into it given our time constraints. So we all know COVID-19 has um, impacted everybody. Um, and every country in the world is being impacted by, by COVID. We are seeing that um, if we look at the World Bank info, that, that the IMF info from yesterday that came out, we saw that the global economy has contracted by over 12 trillion US dollars. That's a lot of money. And this COVID pandemic has highlighted a lot of things in relation to our economy and our society vis-a-vis -vis how we can cope or not cope with external shocks such as COVID or even an earthquake or a hurricane. And it's something that we have been discussing for many years, but with the added um, effects of a pandemic, it's the right time for us to discuss this in some more detail. Now, there are two factors that are really helping to constrain our ability to be more resilient. One of it is our unique circumstance as a small island developing state. And that comes with very unique peculiarities such as um, openness, um, which we know, and I know the, the military people in, in the room and that are participating would know that, that that construct of us being a small island developing state has implications, even for security and some of the issues that we see around crime. And it's the same thing in relation to or economy. And, and also we have to look at the policy and cost barriers that are unique to us and the way our economy has been structured that serve as an inability or make us unable to compete as well as we could in a global context. If we look at how we're being impacted, I mean, these are just some numbers that I wanted you to look at in, in April. The IMF said that you know they thought that global um, output would contract by 1.9 um, by 3%, and then by yesterday we're hearing it's going to be 4.9%, and we don't know where this is going to bottom out because the crisis is continuing and the pandemic is not over, despite what some um, leaders of some countries want to to believe. Um, the reality is is that this pandemic is with us for some time. And um, if we look in the Jamaican context, the BOJ is predicting a 5.1% decline in the economy for this fiscal year, and that's their projection. And of course, that could be um, for um, that could be a lot more. And we're going to be seeing that decline reflected in particular sectors more than others, such as hotel and restaurant, as we know, and the mining sector and wholesale and retail, the entire economy is suffering um, at this point. We're also projecting increases in unemployment. Now that has big implications across the board. It has implications for um, crime, which we had we looked at um, in another session. It also has implications for people's ability to sustain themselves during this pandemic and in light of any other economic shock that may affect us. And, and also, if you look at inflation, though, we're seeing it obviously stay the same. A lot of that is in, in relation to decreased um, demand, too. But what it does, what the picture that we're seeing is that we are a country that's in a lot of economic trouble. We've spent a lot of years 
working really hard to get the fundamentals, the fiscal fundamentals right starting and expand across administrations, which is one of the things that I was so proud of our country because starting with one administration and then going to the other administration and continuing on that IMF program um, was really great for Jamaica. And we were starting to feel like the economy was ready to roar. And then we have COVID and everything seems to be going back. And when we look at the global situation, it's the same thing. The US economy expecting to contract by 8%. As I said, those numbers can change. Those are the projections. No jobless claims going up significantly in, in the US and expectations that the unemployment rate would be about 10% by the end of this year, which is a very high number. And I talk about other countries because, you know, when we talk about our ability to move forward and to recover from this shock or any other shock, because we are so open and dependent externally, it is important that we understand the realities of what's taking place elsewhere in the world. And it's the same thing we're seeing in the OECD countries and in in the UK where we get quite a bit of remittances from also. And so the global picture is not a pretty one. And as we talk about resilience in the Jamaican context and economic resilience, we cannot forget the economic context within which we operate. Again, one of the points I wanna to raise relates to um, some of the key contributors to GDP. And we talk about us being concentrated in particular areas. Tourism, we all know we're very much dependent on tourism and directly it's about 31% um, um, of our GDP. That's a huge number. I mean, when we look at all of the facets um, of tourism and look at all the linkages throughout the economy, it's a big chunk of our economy. And I'm in, I'm in the private sector and we do, and one of our companies does a lot of small business lending. And we are seeing that follow significantly in terms of the tourism sector. A lot of the people who we've seen, you know, with problems um, with their loans are coming from the agricultural sector. So you think agriculture, but when you talk to them, they were supplying the hotels. And so they were indirectly related to the tourism sector. And so it is a lot of individuals that have been affected by, by COVID. When we look at remittances, remittances are, are, are very important to, to Jamaica. It's about 16% of our GDP, those are huge numbers. And so when we see the economic decline in the US and in the UK and in Canada and, and other markets that we get remittances from, it has an impact on the livelihood of our people in our country. And we see it in, in, other, con in other sectors of our economy. But this heavy concentration or dependence on tourism, which is externally driven, and remittances, which are also externally driven and related to realities in external markets, means that we are actually even more, more vulnerable. Now, if we look at economic vulnerability, this is the exposure of, of an economy to exogenous shocks arising from economic openness. So it's that exposure, how exposed are you to shocks? And as a small island developing state, we have lots of exposures. Of course, our dependence on tourism and remittances are, are just one factor, but we're also prone to rising sea levels and all of the things that come along with global, uh, with climate change. And that we are, we're very much more susceptible to those and more vulnerable there. Economic resilience, on the other hand, is the capacity of an economy to resist those. And that's what we're looking at. How do we resist, respond to, and respond to these exogenous shocks to get us to a point, to the point where we were before the shock took place? Now, if you look, there's a lot of literature on resilience. And I just wanted to pick out a few of the factors that make you more resilient because remember the all of this session for an hour and a half will be for us to get to some policy outcomes and some recommendations and so what the literature shows and there are many other things i just picked out these economic diversity is important um so not being heavily concentrated in one sector or a few things is an important factor if you want to become more resilient 
highly skilled labor, labor pools, very important. Political stability, very important. High, val high levels of pre-crisis government expenditure on social protection. That's a very interesting and important one that piggybacks on some of the discussions that took place in the very good panel that was held yesterday on security. And also, if you have already have you know, higher standards of living and looking at social inclusion or exclusion, happiness, health, wages. So these happiness factors, this is an interesting one which came up in the, the health um, panel for a little bit, which was very important too. So how you become more resilient, there are a lot of factors that are at play, and hopefully we can get to discussing some of those in this session. I'm throwing out something out there just to spur, you know, discussion and the start. There are some sectors that we can look to. We said, you know, we're very concentrated and these are areas that we've looked at um, and spoken about. And I know, um, Senator, on, if you're on, on, on online, you know, the can cannabis sector is one. Um, I, I recall recently, a few months ago, when I was in London and I went to a pharmacy because I was having trouble with jet lag. And I said, you know, I need some vitamins or something to help me with this jet lag. And they took me to their corner with cannabis products. And um, it was it was very much, they're like, these are the best selling products that we have. And, you know, as Jamaican, you know, you grew up in a context where you kind of stigmatized marijuana or, or anything cannabis related. But the reality is the rest of the world has caught on to it and are making big money from it. What are the opportunities here? We have we have made some changes in our in our regulatory framework here, but have we done enough? Are we, are we really um, looking at this sector in the way that we should? Financial services, there's much more that can be done there, especially vis-a-vis -vis inclusion and using technology. Um, BPO services, we've spoken about BPOs a lot, not because of you know COVID, but we should also be looking at um, business process outsourcing and knowledge process outsourcing, going up the value chain in HR and finance and other areas of outsourcing. Logistics, we've spoken about logistics for a long time when I was in the public sector, I wrote about the logistics sector and the opportunities that are embedded there. Agriculture, food security, absolutely critical in this time. And so um, these are just some that I'm throwing out because there are others you may have. But there are also barriers to economic diversification. And it's important that as we go through this conversation, we also look at what are the things that are precluding us from making some of the policy changes or getting some of the structural changes that we want in our economy. So we have stuff like fiscal rigidities, the fact that we are still heavily indebted. We are still a heavily indebted country and that constrains our ability to plan for the future and to invest in key things, education, healthcare. I mean, when we're looking at our health infrastructure before COVID, there were a lot of concerns and those concerns were rightly placed because we've not spent a lot of time and money in, in looking at healthcare. And, you know, we've spoken about legislative delays, how long it takes to change laws or energy mix in, in our country is another part of it. Just the difficulty in doing business, difficulty in starting a new new um, business and just getting through red tape, all those things constrain us. And if we're thinking about resilience, we are going to have to look a lot more broadly also at the things that are stymieing our economic development that could help us to withstand economic shocks. Um, I think I've gone over my time <laughs> that I allotted myself. So I'm going to I'm going to stop there and I am going to be moving on to our first panelist, esteemed panelist, who is Lisa Suarez Lewis. Um, she's a founder and CEO of Great People Solutions, um, which she started in 2013. I'm a big believer in women doing big things, and she's done big things. Um, she's worked for so many of our big companies um, in the region, in the areas of uh, banking, telecoms. Um, she worked with Diageo, Cable and Wireless, Scotiabank, KPMG. Um, she sits on many boards in Jamaica, so she doesn't just do her private business. She's also contributing 
to our development and also contributing to the kind of governance that we want to see in our country. And so she sits on the board of Jam Pro, Isinko, Sajikor, Subsidies, Mona School of Business, Sarah, Pension Industry Association of Jamaica and the JSE e campus. And what I'm even more proud of is that she was awarded um, one of the 101 most fabulous global coaching leaders in the world at the World HRD Congress in February this year. So Lisa is just esteemed. I am looking forward to hearing Lisa's presentation and over to you, Lisa. Oh gosh, thank you so much, Dana. Can you hear me okay? I'm, I'm hearing you well. Right. I'm gonna share my slides. All right, uh, okay. So, and let me know if you can see the slides. It's okay? You can see the slides? I'm seeing your slides, seeing it Perfect. well. Okay. Yes, we can see, we can see. All right, thank you so much. Somebody, no call it, let me just hang that up. Um, so thank you very much for the organizers, JDF, the JDF, and the um, I was very excited when I got the call from Mino. You know, are you interested? I said, absolutely, because there is no other team better than this team to kind of drive a top level conversation with the key players. And I'll, I'll tell you a bit more. Um, just from, by way of a little further background, but first of all, that particular award, I had to just muscle up and go to Mumbai. In and when it proved to me that Jamaica was way, way better and punching above our weight in terms of COVID because we were so prepared. When I traveled through New York, I traveled through Milan without realizing it was a hot spot, um, Dubai and Mumbai, none of them compared to Jamaica. So we were all decked out in our, with our antibacterial and masks. And I thought, oh my gosh, we have a leg up compared to everybody else. So I know that we can keep that momentum and we have proven it. Um, I usually start this presentation, which I did in April, to kind of get some of the edge off. I was getting very worried that leaders were not taking this thing seriously. And with my background, where I remember exactly where I was on September the 12th, 1988, I was actually in between jobs. I thought I wouldn't even have a job. But I realized after that, like a lot of people in Jamaica, that we would not be the same. So we were going to actually come out of that, realizing that no other hurricane was going to catch us flat-footed. Um, since then, I worked with telecoms. Working with telecoms is great. You understand what an emergency operations center looks like. You understand the value of the JDF, the value of the JCF. Um, you understand telecoms. You have to even communicate before you can even find water. You know, in in, in our in our kind of generation, um, you have to understand also energy. These are critical NGOs, and I'm going to share a little bit more about that. But I really appreciate what a crisis means and risk management and things like resilience and getting back to normalcy. So on top of that, I have a huge ambition for Jamaica. My purpose is really to transform leadership in Jamaica. So this just kind of fit right in, how can I help? And I realized I was surrounded by a lot of inertia, scared leaders, public sector, private sector, nobody sharing information. I mean, only now we're kind of getting this kind of revelation of what, wow, it really looks that way. I, we're talking about from March when I picked up that, wow, this thing is not good, and April when I put pen to paper and decided to do this. So I'm sharing this paper just to kind of recognize that I had to do a visualization. So between being a consultant and a coach, I needed to give people a picture that you needed to see what was happening to figure out how do we actually put one foot in front of the other. As, as other persons said, and I enjoyed all the presentations that I was able to catch, this thing fell on our shoulders. So what do we do? We have to figure out, we have to get up, dust it up and move it. So I'm gonna just carry you through because it is a breakthrough issue and I'm a breakthrough coach. And I would love to just add stuff to the chat. I know Mina is on and if we monitor the chat, we can even pick up some questions and you know, hand them back to Dana. So it's really a visualization for a mindset shift. And in showing you what that means, um essentially when we look at leaders and how we actually change things when you start to shift the mindset one of the easiest ways to do that is to dig down deep what caused you to shift your mindset what was that hard experience you overcame and it led me naturally to the hurricane visualization so although we're dealing with covid what came to us as a medical issue it evolved it evolved in a big way and i want to show you that at the end of the day when we looked at it, 
we were able to know, I was able to say, well, okay, this is a real problem. So I'm gonna put this up on the screen because for you, you may want to even think about yourself. And we use this, I use this presentation in my consulting business with firms from the CEO down to the lowest level of the organization, some elements of it, but I ask them to take a note of this. What's the impact on you personally, your household, your organization, your industry, your government, and what's the extraordinary opportunity for you, your organization, your business, your industry, your government, because we have to get to the right hand side. This is not just resiliency and recovery. This demands growth. So at the top, you'll see prepare, protect, recover, grow, grow fast and grow strong. That is what COVID does for us. It pulls all of what we saw about yesterday and today, and it really puts us in a position that we have to move. So this is really the heart of the presentation. I know we have a hurricane season that has started. We didn't even plan for this Sahara dust, it's here. And we know climate change is just a ticking time bomb. It's, I don't wanna say it that way, but you know, it's kind of in the background. What we have now is literally four hurricanes, and I use hurricanes because we know how to overcome hurricanes. So we have to dig deep in what do we do with hurricanes? Only issue is that this four of them happening at the same time. They're active and they're agile. And I would actually say every now and again, when you read about COVID, it's unforgiving because COVID is coming with a new wave later this year. It's unforgiving. They don't care whether you're a world leader. You're Boris Johnson, or you're going to get COVID too, you know? Oh, you, you have mass, mass transit and you have a great economy. Oh, well, I'm going to tell you how to shut it down. So COVID is a, is a very active and agile thing, but so is so are the hurricanes that follow. So if you count each one of them as a hurricane, one, two, three, and four, hurricane two is economic. Social is a big word. It, it covers a number of things, what that means. And the technological has always been there. So I want to just go away quickly and I'm going to come back to this. But I want you to take a little task and put a number, like if you're assigned in a category one or a category two, and let's go up to category five, just assign some numbers to your circles and then we can come back to that. So I'm gonna start with category of the COVID medical. And I put some things on the slide because one of the things it has taught us is that we can't look on data through the lens of Italy or the UK or through CNN. In fact, turn those TVs off and look on the data and figure out what we're having for Jamaica. If you remember on the right-hand side of this slide that we were always trying to flatten the curve and stay under it with your protective measures. Because if you go over it, then you're, you're basically, you know, if we had, Italy had, we would be so far over and in such a devastating state. And in fact, guess what? That's what Brazil has. So we now know that's possible in our region. But when we think about it, we had real issues. We're actually under capacity for respirators. We haven't even got there yet. We got 40 from the EU. We don't even get to touch those. Some of them must be still in plastic. We're just not using that aspect of COVID. PPE, we've been pretty good. Ignore what you see in the public if you see some people tweeting it. We have PPE for public health persons and at the airport. Nursing density, it's terrible. Look on this graph, this is 2018. We are probably one of the worst nursing densities in the world. We are under 10, we are like 8.07 to over 10,000 persons in Jamaica. The only people in that region with us is Haiti. That's the only company we have, okay? Us and there are some people in Africa. We are 8.07, you have Barbados at 30, we have Trinidad at 40. So we have a nursing issue, but because we're not having hospitalization on a red, amber, green scale, we're not bad. Here is where the problem is. We're over capacity here. So we have to find different ways of dealing with quarantine facilities. We can't have everybody going into quarantine. You know, we have to trust people to be able to quarantine their families. Somebody who had children on the high seas that came back to Jamaica, they should be able to probably move out of the house and let the child stay in the house if he's eating a two bedroom, one bedroom, and allow them to heal if that's the case. Testing adequacy, speed of testing. We can't be testing for three days when people are coming back and getting in and open our border. We probably need to speed that up. So these are the areas we need to work on. And in the early days, we had a lot of stigma. So, you know, these are the things that would take us to code red. For us, it's not operators. Good thing we can't afford the electricity bill, so keep the windows open because aerosolization is a big issue. So that, that, that's basically how I look on COVID. COVID isn't so bad. The economic is really my biggest issue, and you'll see as I go along. Problem with economic is that that hurricane, 
We have never had a cat fad in Jamaica, not in the lifetime of anybody on this call. We don't know what it felt like when Dorian hit the Bahamas or Maria hit Dominica. And if you know hurricanes, and when I was at Cape Navales, I never, I don't know what my house looked like. I, I, I was working during the hurricane in the emergency operations center. So I, I know what it is like when the hurricane is blowing and having to manage communication with the national communication, liaising with various entities like JDF and others. The reality is in the category five, you can't really plan too much for you. What you do is you plan for the recovery and the normalcy because the picture of the category five looks like this. And I purposely put this picture on because we've never seen that in Jamaica. Now, I remember I'm trying to use a proxy of the hurricane to what we have with COVID. The issue we have here, obviously, is that our economy is very service oriented. It's dependent on households having incomes and consumers spending money. So businesses can provide services and goods. Tourism dependencies, we are the most dependent tourism in region in the world. 35% of our GDP is driven by tourism. And of course, nearly half, a, half of our exports, so to speak. So if there are no visitors coming, that is a huge economic engine that we've turned off. And if we don't get an economic engine turned on, and it's going to take some while to get it moving, our dip in GDP, which is obviously a real deep dip in the quarter, could last for a long time. So we have to look on the numbers and be realistic. The disproportionate loss of business, remember SMEs are the biggest employer in Jamaica. So you're finding that when you look on underemployed or labor force of one, employed labor force of 1.25 million, nearly half of that actually would be at minimum wage, below minimum wage, um, underemployed, not skilled. They're really employed by SMEs or vendors or individuals that are working, household helpers, who are even days workers. You're talking about a disproportionate impact when SMEs start to fail. So this, this is really the biggest hurricane, but I'm not going to take away anything from you in terms of what category you give it. And remember, it takes cash to care. So if you don't have businesses making profits and paying government taxes, then it's hard to keep government together. You may have job loss. You may even have permanent scarring in your economy. So this is a big issue. Um, three, very you, you can't detach a social piece from the economic piece. And there are a number of things listed here. We had a, you know, some great presentations by, I think it's Terry Williams. You know, Dr. Houghton spoke about in, in, in his economic presentation, he brought it down to a very understandable language for us as well. Um, Tony Clinton, all of those presentations covered things that you're seeing on this slide as well. Um, crime is major. Um, the point of the matter is that when we look on what's happening at a household level, um, early childhood commission is already saying that they're seeing more child abuse. Um, the education setbacks are not gonna hurt us this year. They're gonna set, set us back for years if we don't transform. And that's another conversation we'll have. And it goes on. So these are things that we have to realize that the hurricane of the social side of things, which includes crime, medical, et cetera, are, are, are actually very attached to the economic. The final one is actually what, you know, um, I would say Dr. Um, Maurice McDonald outlined really, really well for us today. And in his, um, that's 11 minutes of my 15, I'll, just, I'll try and wrap up in the next three or four minutes. Um, when we look on the cyber and, and the things that were coming out here, it ties in. This hurricane was here before COVID. It was always in the background, always having jobs around the world and in Jamaica, which could be offshored converted into AI, anything that's repetitive can be converted and replaced by robotics. And it's forcing leadership to redefine itself because our leaders weren't even prepared to, they weren't doing a great job managing people face-to-face -face, much less work from home. So the transformation is happening even in government. And think about some of the things that the government has been able to do in terms of electronic payments. Those are fantastic things that even the government is transforming faster than they knew they could. When we think of COVID, you know, the kind of electronic monitoring that we have, take these things seriously. These are things that we have to do more of, not less. So the global competitiveness, I'll say just two things about it. We are actually doing some work at Jamper and we have a competitiveness, we have a productivity um, group. And I want you to understand how low we are in productivity, which is why our GDP never really got higher than 1% or even some years half percent and this year would have been a breakthrough year and i think dana set that context for things that hold back our gdp we have like 90 kpis 
but the most troubling ones are things that we just never move the needle. So for example, our score for homicides is zero. We rank 140 out of 141. Or R&D, we have a score of 31, but we actually rank 123 out of 141. So consider that um, zero. Um, that's an R that was our e-participation rather. And we have rankings of e-participation of 115 out of 141. So we're not knowing where we need to be in relation to technology and using it to get to jumpstart our, our economy and competitiveness. Um, Dana mentioned this, I just grabbed this today so you to understand that even when you're looking on data, this is a data that IMF says is really just much worse than they expected. And the job description destruction has been catastrophic. When you look on this data, you don't see Jamaica in this. You may see emerging and developing economies, excluding China, they are not tracking a small island developments, developing state or an economy that is most dependent on tourism anywhere in the world. So that's a number that we have to see. The BOJ numbers are unlikely to hold. And I think the PIOJ actually has higher, uh, larger or worse numbers than what is there, but you know, we have to take it. So in summary, I don't know what scores you had, maybe we can talk about it, but my suggestion is that the biggest issue we have is an economic issue. It's a category five, never saw it coming. We didn't plan for it. We couldn't track it. We didn't do all the prep that we would have with, but we had a hurricane. And therefore what we have to do is accept that we have it and we have to think differently to come out of it. We can come back to this conversation at some point in time, but I just wanted to focus that if we don't get the economics right, it takes cash to care, even for what we're doing. And if we don't have the cash, we have to get to a level that we think and do things differently. So as a coach, I mean, take off the consulting hat, put on the coach hat, we just have to step back and breathe. Because one of the things we have to dig down on is that that resiliency for recovery, resiliency, recovery, and the ability to grow must come up now. And I think in anything we do, we have to align, we have to show the numbers. Not, don't be afraid to discuss numbers. You know, I know politically it's not cool. It takes away your energy, but that's, you know, we don't have time for that anymore. We have to get to recovery and grow. And this is a simple coaching concept that we use that when you're in a real crisis, so that you don't, you avoid sitting in that crisis and doing nothing. We use our breakthrough thinking to kind of get to the point where you have extraordinary thinking. So when you think of what Shannon spoke about earlier today and all those things that China is doing and so on, we cannot be complacent and think what we're doing is good enough. It is not. We have great things. Yes, Jamaica COVID, the, 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 the GIS thing is great, but we need to take that bigger. So extraordinary thinking ambitions, extraordinary actions and extraordinary outcomes. And I think I wanted to just position that when we're talking about policy, if we're not putting the policy through this acid test, I'm gonna suggest that we need to just say, well, that's not good enough, let's do more. So it's a great conversation to have as we've wrapped up what happened yesterday into today, but we have to have that standard. And I'm gonna leave you with this last slide. So the reason I thought about hurricanes and solutions is because the, the kind of disaster planning framework we have for hurricanes is basically in a model we have for disaster recovery, the pain model. And the person in charge is a prime minister and a coordinated team. And if you look at the top right hands, you will see JDF and JCF. That is who drives the national team, the NGOs. Pem. So we have to look on the proxy of this to use, how do we get out of here? Because it kind of has to have a nice combination of command and control, uh, emergency operation center approach, but it must also have extraordinary thinking because we have to grow as well. We can't just do resistance and recovery because it's not gonna come back. We have to now grow and bring that same thinking into growing. Tourism is obviously an engine that we have to start up. So, you know, I don't watch COVID numbers anymore. My colleagues will tell you, it could be 500, it could be a thousand. That, that doesn't even, you know, as long as we protect the vulnerable, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, okay, so how do we get this thing going? Because if we don't have cash, we can't even help to fight COVID. So tourism has to get up and running. Businesses have to think differently. We've got to transform. And if you look at these things closely, you'll see education is in everything. We've got to keep the education going and transform. The international team is critical. We have to borrow what we have. The GOJ team is transforming and they have to transform. And education is one of those that is slow to the mark. They have to transform. And of course, the partnership. 
So from here, um, we basically like to bring it open to a conversation like this, where we push your thinking, but we push your thinking to kind of get to where this is. It's all in extraordinary thinking, extraordinary actions, and extraordinary outcomes. And I think, you know, entities like the JDF and certainly the JCF and any other that have worked in hurricanes know that they have to think differently. But that's the hat we have to keep on for the period going on. So I would say that's basically the end of the presentation. And um, back to you. All right. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I knew I was looking forward to the presentation and I know you you cut it down and there's a lot of other rich things there, but when we get to the conversation, we're going to be able to get to that. Um, I'm going to be moving on to the section where we actually start discussing policy. And I think Lisa um, has started us off and we have a couple other panelists that are, are going to be giving you their thoughts, but I wanted to go to um, Captain David Chin Fong next, but um, just to tell you how I want us to look at it going forward. I think we need to look at how we build resilience for the now. There's a now thing in relation to a hurricane possibly happening this year. And then we also have to think about resilience for the future. And so I'm kind of compartmentalizing it a little bit when we get into the discussion question um, section. But I wanted to bring Captain Chin Fung in. And um, for those of you who don't know him, um, Captain David Chin Fung, he assumed um, the role of brigade commander for the support brigade in October last year. Before that, he was Colonel, Colonel Adjutant Quartermaster, um, which he held for a bit before that. Um, he's been trained um, in the UK and he was posted in the JDF at the coast um, with the Coast Guards and served in many different regions. He's very highly esteemed. He attended a junior staff college in 1999 at the Caribbean Junior Command and Staff College here in Jamaica and also um, the Senior Staff College in 2005 at the Naval War College in Rhode Island. Um, he has a master's degree in national security and strategic studies at the wonderful University of the West Indies. He's also I saw, an alum of the Center for Hemispheric and Defense Studies in Washington, D.C. I did some studies there, too. Um, he's a recipient of the Medal of Honor for Meritorious Service, along with the first bar to the medal, the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal, the General Services Medal, and the Medal of Honor for Long Service and Good Conduct. Um, he obviously comes with a wealth of experience and it's always good to get the input of the JDF and, and, and their officials. And given where Lisa showed us how important the JDF is in relation to the response vis-a-vis -vis any of these big shocks, such as a hurricane, I, I want to hear your views, Captain, um, in the time of COVID plus potential hurricane. Hey, good afternoon. Hey, I'm here. Good afternoon. Thank you for that. I, I, I must say how honored I am to be in this in this magnificent um, uh, company here. Um, certainly don't match up to the to the um, to the level of persons here. But good, good to be. Um, I, I must say that I was surprised when I was asked to be a part of this because I'm a security practitioner and not an economic practitioner. But nonetheless, I just thought I don't have a presentation, but I just thought I could also share my thoughts on this whole matter of resilience and how do we get out of this and um and and, and what i'm thinking though is 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 we need to have some principles that will allow us to be resilient in any type of crisis whether whether one that is brought on by a pandemic whether one that is brought on by a natural disaster um, if we don't have a one size fits all solution, at least we can have some some principles that we can go by. And you know, you know, Dana, when I when when I heard your presentation, um, you know, I, I afterwards I was so disheartened. Although after that, Miss Miss um, Miss Miss Lisa, <laughs> Miss, Miss Suarez, though, is, um, left me feeling quite motivated because. Some of the potential sectors that you mentioned 
um, we have not been able, there have been potential for quite some time, and we have not been able to, 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 to make the potential into something more than it is. So, for example, the cannabis industry, albeit fairly young, um, but as far as I know, not moving in the right direction. The logistics hub, um, talking about it for close to a decade, um, so much so that we have not been getting quite any feedback from the good professor, um, a good friend of mine who's been working on it, unless they're working quietly. The financial sector as well. Um, and this may be a simple statement, but it still, you know, it still takes me, or it would still take me a good five, six hours, a whole batch of documents to open an account at a bank, which I already have an account, um, and as, as an example. And so these sectors have a lot of potential, I agree, but we have not been able to harness that potential. So I want to put one of them um, on the table because, again, it's part of what I do, and it is part of, 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 um, of what the Prime Minister has been talking about for the last two years, and that's the blue economy. A blue economy, of course, refers to the the economic potential that can come from the maritime or marine environment. Um, we, have, we have one of the largest fishing banks in Jamaica, the Petra Keys Offshore Fishing Bank, the, the biggest stock of lobster and conch that you can find in this region. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. We export to Europe, we export to Asia, we export to, to North America. And, and it is one of the largest stock because you do so very well at sustaining it. Um, we have our open season, we have our closed seasons, but I think there is so much more that we can do. Of course, there's also talk about the, 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 the potential for, for oil and natural gas and so on, that we can manage. We have, we, have so we have so many historical dive sites, again, that can be a part of tourism. So there's so much that we can harness in the blue economy. And of course, once you establish one of these type of industries in the blue economy, then a lot of things will flow from it. Um, and so I want to put that on the table, um, Dana, as one of the potential sectors um, that we can harness. Um, but as I was trying to do some reading to prepare myself for, 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 for this discussion, I, I did find that well, before I go to the principles, I, I, I want to say that in, in, in touching a little bit on what um, Lisa mentioned, um, you have touched so much on the JDF, and what, what we are doing is to, is to further explore what we do best, just to see how we leverage that as a growth engine for, for, the, for the country. So we do training quite well. We do youth engagement quite well. And so taken on this Genesee program, where we're now training over 750 young men for a year. For those who do not want to come into the regular force, we send them into the, um, into the public sector. I hope I'm not repeating stuff that has been said over the last year or so. But this is something that the JDF does well. Um, and, and, and I think the government has realized that, and they are certainly milking that. As long as this is something that they can fund, we can develop the youth, we can train the youth, and we can put them into other areas of production with other public and private sector organizations. And I think if as a principle, we can identify other similar government organizations or private sector organizations as, as being able to, as being experts in a particular area and milk it for what it's worth. You know, similar to what we do with what we do with the whole program, I think that is certainly a diversified approach um, to becoming resilient. And so I will just wrap up what I'm saying by saying that, by, by, by closing, to say that in my reading, I discussed that, I, I, I observed that, that in all the studies that were done about building economic resilience, and I think no matter the disaster that you are faced with, it will impact the economy, no doubt about it, and it will impact um, the social fabric. So if we, look at, if we look at certain principles that can hold true for economic resilience, it would hold true for no matter whatever disaster that you're faced with. And, 
And a lot of it speaks about economic diversity. And I think you had touched on that. Um, you know, when you spoke about, um, I have the notes here, where did I put it? Um, it certainly wasn't one of your slides in, in being diverse and not being too reliant on one major source of income. Um, that is a pillar I think we should work towards in becoming resilient. We should work towards developing a very highly skilled labor force, um, a highly experienced labor force, because the reading suggests to me that a young labor force is not necessarily the best thing you want to become economically resilient. You need to have an experienced labor force and a highly skilled labor force. So again, I put that as another pillar of what we would need to do to become um, economically re resilient. And of course, there's entrepreneurship, there is local ownership and local investments. So, so in, 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 in wrapping up, and I've said that several times, I'm gonna be wrapping up. I think, I think when we come up with these policies and, and you know, in this closed session, I hope that you know the Chatham House rules apply. Whatever we do, whatever we do, whatever we sell or we bring forth as policies must have some kind of a political component that um, our political masters will buy in. Um, and so that is really my challenge, as I say, that we need to put forward some pillars. These pillars that we put forward have to be not only relevant in making us economically um, resilient, but also has to strike a chord um, with the ruling party. Um, and I'm no politician, and I have no idea <laughs> how we're going to do that. Um, so I close by saying that, you know, as I've said, that, that, that I think we need to have some very, very broad principles. We can't be too specific with our recommendations because having some broad principles will hold through the disaster that's going to hit us and that's going to break the economy. Those are my few remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. Those were very, very good. I saw some discussions as you were speaking. I think what you're saying resonates a lot um, with everybody, especially you're um, bringing up the blue economy as an area that we've not really spoken to very much. Um, and Lisa pointed out that the Branson Center is looking at that and looking at how the JDF in terms of um, its own role is such an important part of our, our, our country in terms of helping to get to that kind of breakthrough thinking that we want. And your discussions about labor reform link back to what Lisa was saying before vis-a-vis -vis productivity and how far behind we are um, the rest of the world in terms of productivity. Um, and um, I'm looking back through through the chat um, and looking at some of the things that were being said, but you were, they were being, they were agreeing with you. And so I think it's a really good jumping off point. I don't see um, Dr. Houghton or Dr. McNaughton. I don't see either of them. So we are going to engage in the conversation. It's, it's, um, it's nice for us to do so. And I'm going to just tell you from what I've been hearing so far from the discussion and you're not off the hook yet captain because i want to hear your views because we've spoken about diversification and some other elements and productivity and so on but the reality is we're still a poor country and we see that five percent of our gdp we lose every year because of crime if we could solve the crime problem. The crime problem isn't just a crime problem. And a lot of times we kind of look at it in, in, in a vacuum. Our problem, it's a social problem. It's an economic problem. It's a whole of society problem. Um, and so I really do want you to at some point come in on that dimension, on the security dimension as an element of economic resilience going forward. But, but from what I've heard so far, um, there is diversification. Um, there was discussion around productivity with several elements there, the lack of R&D, limited e-participation, the need for skills and experienced um, workers, entrepreneurship. I also heard some social elements in there were very unequal com 
country with large sorts of poverty. It means when people are poor and um, living just day to day, it, they are even more susceptible and to those shocks affecting them in a negative way. Um, I was hearing lots on education um, and also something that we've not discussed yet, and which I hope when we start the conversation is this factor that you were bringing up and um, Captain, you kind of took it down a political road, which I want to bring it back, but Lisa, you mentioned it also with the partnership. Um, it's this element of trust um, in our society. How do we engender trust? I mean, there's so much research that's been done that shows that we don't trust each other. That obviously has an impact on economic outcomes in our country. And it also has an impact on us with our, our government and our trust of our government. And what I found interesting and one of my own little bits of private research is looking at what COVID tells us about how we can build trust. We saw those press conferences. We saw our government giving us data on what was happening. There was a constant conversation with the people. It was, it to a certain extent, it felt the way democracy really should be, which was a very deep interplay with politicians and the government and the people. And we were seeing that um, playing out during this COVID crisis. And so when I look on CNN, which Lisa says we mustn't watch too much of, and I see the debate about whether or not people should wear masks and people demonstrating about masks, in our country, an argument was made about masks and quite early we saw everyone wearing masks. I spoke to a friend recently who is in Las Vegas and, um, and was telling me about, you know, what's happening and people don't want to wear masks. He's like, what's happening in your country? And I said, well, we've just been bought onto that for a long time. <laughs> uh, but so sometimes we, we see ourselves in a negative light, but there are a lot of things in COVID that are showing us that we've done things right and we need to build on those. But it also uncovers a lot of issues, issues with our health system, issues with our economy, issues with inequality. When we look at, uh, Lisa brought up e-participation, look at education. Kids are having to use Zoom. A lot of our children are getting left behind because they don't have equal access to Wi-Fi and devices so that they can do their work. And so I'm going to open it up. I see. Lisa, you're you're putting a lot in the chat, and I want to bring in. Uh, there's Omar Chetta. There are a lot of people here. Faye Ellington. I'm seeing. I'm seeing Mina. You were on at some point. There are a lot of other people on. Lloyd it. This, and Lloyd Distance as well. I think oh, Lloyd. Lloyd just wanted to let you know. Lloyd. Yeah, he's a he's a he. I, I saw him before. The president of the um, JCC. So I, I I'm honest like like I love these things and I I tend to use a lot of chat. So if if your question is not there, or raise a hand, just drop it in the chat. Dana is monitoring it, and we'd love to just hear more. I I, I just wanted to say two things, Dana. That um, what Go Captain ahead. said was right. The blue economy, um, JDF owning the youth. If we can fix the youth issue, that would be great because we just need to get owners attached to some of our big issues. Um, the economic diversity, I saw that Larry said some things. I'm going to just throwing a couple of things that John Pro is trying to do. We have two schools of thought. Some people say choose industries. We also have economists who say make Jamaica easy to do business and don't choose. So there are two things, you know, which is right. Maybe that's a, that's a topic of another symposium. Um, the labor reform skills and flexibility. We have the Flexible Work Arrangements Act. Do we are we at the point that we should say, well, the flexible work arrangements act is applicable to every company now? But when we checked it out, people were just nibbling at the edges. Is that time over? Should we have a policy position now that says it has to happen? And then the political part of it, I would say that's this last thing. Um, politics skills crisis management. You can't do both. JDF knows that better than anybody else. You can't manage a crisis with politics. So there's going to be some health attention. I prefer in this situation and conversation to be an unpaid consultant because then I can say how I feel. But I'm only saying that, you know, we rely on JDF to kind of and other individuals and companies and um, stakeholder groups to just keep it on track because it's really hard to do both. And we are in a deep crisis. So that's what I wanted to say. And I'll help you to monitor the chat. 
All right, thank you, thank you, Lisa. Is there anyone who I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it out? Omar, what are your thoughts? I mean, you have a lot of experience in this area. Yes, I, I would have to say I disagree with the comment that was just made about the political aspect. I think, um, especially considering Jamaica's political culture, that you have to involve the political representatives because they are leaders, you know, in the community. Um, all the changes that you require or the, or the behaviors that you require to facilitate economic resiliency, uh, the, the leaders of the communities and the political representatives will have to speak with their, their people and you know, get them to, to buy into it. So I think they have a role to play, maybe not the, the primary role, but they have a role. Um, being a, a poor country economically, undiversified, that definitely affects our resiliency. So the, the long-term solution is that we need to, to develop our econo economy. We need to diversify our economy, have greater skills, uh, more markets producing, you know, a greater variety of things higher up the value chain. However, what can we do now? Because you made that point, Dino. Uh, what are the short-term solutions? I was just thinking that this crisis forced me to do two things. It, it caused me to go online much more, you know. Um, I had to do some business at the tax office, and um, I, 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 I had to do it online. I actually went to the tax office, and they told me to do it online, uh, which I did, and I had to do some bank transfers, which I actually didn't know how to do before on my online account. And... Um, I was able to do it, but what I found it's difficult, you know, unless you have a certain level of education and you're, you have a certain level of um, digital savvy, uh, you know, it's not easy. I can imagine the average man on the road, he doesn't know how to, to do all these things. So we, we have to make uh, becoming digitized easier for the average man. And also education, uh, years ago, you know, I was part of a group that we were discussing moving education online. It doesn't have to be brick and mortar anymore. You see people build, still building large concrete facilities, and but we could have moved a lot of the educational facilities online years ago. And, and so we're, we're being forced to do that now and we're not prepared. So these are some of the issues that we need to think about. All right, thank you, Omar. Um, I'm just gonna pick on people who are here. Uh, Mina, is there anything you wanted to to add to the discussion. Thank you, Dana, and thank you, team. I mean, what amazing, amazing um, discussion. Um, one, of the, one of the things I'd love to talk about um, in my role at the University of the West Indies, and, um, and Lisa talked about that, the need for jobs. Um, go, go down this road with me. Imagine a student, a second year student, whose parent is a duty driver, his dad is a duty driver, and the mom works in the hotel sector in Montego Bay. What do you think is gonna happen this year for that student? The likelihood is that that student would ask for a leave of absence for a year. We have heard from, we've heard from the Minister of Finance that the student loan applications are down 40% year over year. What does that mean for tertiary institutions? How do you plan for that? Not knowing how many students are coming back this year and not knowing how many faculty members you need. So you have the high fixed cost and you don't know what revenue you'll be getting. So it really, the, this challenge, the hurricane is touching every sector. And um, as we pause, you know, we have to look at opportunities, different creative ways of helping to, to fund our, our students, helping our universities. You know, we need more alignment and partnership with industry and, and, and our tertiary institutions. And even if we take it down to early childhood, we have already heard about private institutions closing. What does that mean for young kids? What does that mean for our older kids who are going to university? So this thing is such a hurricane. And um, being able to manage, and for how long? A lot of us say it's a year. I believe it's gonna be at least two years before we get out of the slump. And therefore, we all hands have to be on deck. All alignment with industry, academia, government, 
to really make sure we, we recover from this in, in, in a sustainable way. So, you know, I'm just so pleased with the conversations over the past two days, um, whether it was on health, security, and now the economy. Um, uh, my, my only regret is this was not open to more people because I have a group of persons who say, can I come in? Can I listen in? And um, that's my regret, that we didn't expose more people to this level of conversation. But guys, thank you so much for this. Thank you very much, Mina. Um, there, there, there are a lot of things, and I'm, I'm going to try to pull everything together. Is there anyone else who wants to make a comment? Um, I just wanted to make a quick comment. I'm Camille sure. Ram Hutchinson. Uh, hi, Mina. I'm Camille at UA. I'm now the registrar at the Caribbean Military Academy, and I'm putting on my education hat. I just saw a comment from Lisa. Um, which is which is fundamental to a lot of the discussions we're having about education. And earlier, Captain spoke about the online dilemma and having to do more things online. We need to focus a lot on teacher education because those are the ones that are going to be transforming classrooms, um, for, uh, enabling youngsters and oldsters. And I, when I say teacher education, I'm talking about from early childhood right back to tertiary education, right? The, the full gamut of it. There's, it's no longer a time when we can sit back and, and think that it's, an, it's a normal. It's a brand new normal. And the way in which you educate our children from early childhood right through to tertiary education is going to be fundamentally important to any transformation in our society. And I thought we needed to kind of put that in as a very important aspect of resilience. Thank you, Camila. You're 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 absolutely right, and it comes out in so many dimensions. And and Lisa showed you how far we are in terms of e-participation generally. And um, if we're going to be looking to that future, I mean, you know, there's all this talk about fourth industrial revolution, which is about technology and the amount of growth that takes place. And you're right. I see it, Lisa. Time is against us. Um, the world is going to move forward on the basis of technology. And so there is actually one advantage that comes out of this crisis, one of many, um, and that is that we've been forced down this road of technology. And it's been a long time in coming. Um, when we saw all those long lines of people waiting for their care, um, their care payments from the government, that should not have happened. When we had Ivan back in 2004, and there was a lot of devastation in our economy from that hurricane, the government was also strapped in terms of how do we provide payments? And I know some of the banks tried, you know, a few things to try to help the government to get the payments to people. That was 2004. And from then to now, we've not been able to put a better system in place to deal with that. And of course, um, there are some things that have been done. We see some changes in terms of the opening of the bank accounts, that you need a few less things if depending on risk and having that risk-based assessment. If somebody's only putting $10,000 a month into their account, you don't need a bag of forms. Um, and the BOJ is more sympathetic to that and we're happy for that. But there's a lot more that we have to do, and I'm glad that our children are getting to see technology alive. And um, I'm hearing one of my eight year olds saying, oh, miss, let me share my screen and show you this. You're not doing it the right way. This is where you should have gone. But those are my children. What about the rest of our Jamaican children? Every child should be as exposed to technology as this. And our teachers, as you said, Camille, need to be trained so that they can help our children to be a part of this fourth industrial revolution or else we are going to be left behind. We're already left behind. Um, hey, what are you saying here? <laughs> I'm seeing you participating. I don't know if you wanted to chime in, Faye, you're in the chat. Yes, yes. Faye, yes, Faye, we want to hear your voice. <laughs> Thank you for inviting us to chime in. Let's call the same man, people Right? And what I mean by that, for those who are not so comfortable with the Jamaican language, is simply <laughs> we have sat around for a very long time, um, twiddling our thumbs, 
and not accepting and allowing some persons who are thinking in a particular way that exceptional thinking that is the focus. A long time of people are reason, you know, especially now I'm going to hit a big ball here, especially if it came from women, sometimes it was not accepted. That is something that we need to look at. But I also want to speak about you know how we dropped the ball when i started out in broadcasting in 1974 and this must have started in the 60s there was half hour every day on the jamaica broadcasting corporation in the mornings for uh, educational programs to be broadcast they were produced by the educational broadcasting services which was uh, down on camp road south camp road where jamal eventually went etc and those programs were done spanish all kinds of topics were attended to so there was that vision a long time ago what happened i'm not sure and um, as camille will tell you the university of the west indies had what was uedite and then uedec and online and open campus and all of that uh, and so we are in a dilemma just now, uh, but it doesn't mean that we have to stay there. Uh, somebody made a comment earlier on today, and I think it was uh, Dr. Rowe from Barbados, and he said, you know, we need to look at the big picture. I agree with that, but I also would like to warn us, it's not only the big picture, but a different picture. You're, you're very right, Faye, um, and it goes back into uh, some of what you said, Lisa, with this breakthrough leadership. We're thinking of breakthrough leadership. You're right, Faye, we're looking at a different picture. What does that different picture look like? What is that future um, that we see that is more resilient and that we understand? Change is coming, shocks are going to be coming. Those are constant things. But for us in Jamaica, a lot of times when the shock comes, it's like, how come? I mean, how come this happened? You know, we're not prepared for it. Go ahead, Lisa. Yes, I, I, you know, as we are seeing responses in the chat and hearing it, we, one of the biggest challenges we have, for example, is education. And you remember when Eduino, the futurist came, that was the area that we knew we were most vulnerable in, as we were with the rest of the world. So, you know, you have to think about things, seeing the glass half full. One thing the world did, you know, is just flatten us all with COVID. I know we're kind of starting at the same spot. So if there's any feeling that it's not that bad is that we're all like at ground zero and the internet of things, you know, the things Mark Norton spoke about today really allows us to leapfrog and go faster. So think about it. Should we really go back to classroom training in the way we were doing it in, 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 in September? should we really just get to blend in because really and truly if covid remains and there is everything there we can't fill the classrooms in the current shift so we have a capacity issue so therefore i love when you get into a policy decision and discussion because really it allows us to do some sweeping policies which we didn't know we could do or would do or had the power to do so coming back to what Faye and everybody is saying what happens in September is not going to be an improvement of what we did last in January or February before COVID or March when we closed schools. It has to be risk-based. It has to be different. We're going to have to use technology. And that's why even, you know, every teacher needs to kind of close their capability gap in the summer because we can't stop the education. But think about where we're coming from. Teachers were still worried about using a biometric to determine whether they're at work or not. That can't be a conversation that we would want to continue because we have gone past that. So I would say, you know, there's some nuggets about how technology can be used. And the government has done a great job to prove that we can use technology in a way that all we have to do now, you know, is take some of those examples and make them bigger for Jamaica. So I think education is a conversation that we, we can't delay too much because school is happening and if we, we need children in schools at the early childhood institution level so people can even get to work because obviously we need people to get to work for the economy to grow that's it i see camille is agreeing very much with you lisa um in the chat um she's saying yes we need to look at a different type of educating and, and obviously and that's that's immediate that is in time for for september because COVID is not going anywhere um, and we're going to have to be ready for September in a different kind of way. And, and, and Captain, I see um, you're also um, adding in there. Um, and this is 
maybe JDF wants to help with this, but Captain, is there anything you want to add to the discussion before I try to start pulling the policy pieces together that this team is recommending, you know, in getting us out of this inertia and looking at a different kind of future for Jamaica? Um, um, no, not at all. Um, I think, I think certainly from the input of everybody, we have all captured it from, from, from the other sites. Um, I'll just say that um, security and economic, economy are, are inextricably linked. I think we can all accept that. Um, the Prime Minister was focused on fixing crime, and so a lot of resources were put our way over the last two years. And um, security and education, I think once we, once we, as we've been saying for the last 10 minutes, once we focus on education and all the persons who are involved in the education of our, of our kids and youths, the parents, the teachers, and of course, the students themselves, um, I think we'll be on a good path in, in becoming resilient because we can't all tackle the, all tackle the, 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 the various solutions that we're going to put on the table if there's a cost associated with it. Um, and we have to manage the expectations, of course. As I was saying, just so well, as I typed, that if we're going to transition into this new paradigm where we're going to leverage in technology, it's going to be a bumpy period. And during that bumpy period, we're going to be wondering and questioning the decision. Um, are we getting it right? Are we doing the right thing? Um, how do we make it all encompassing? I mean, I mean, my, my, my Wilma's I, in my little chat group there, when they opened back the school, they realized that many, many students weren't able to access the online education. So how do you, how do you reach out to those who don't have the, the quote unquote luxury of, of getting online? Um, how do you, how do you compensate for the, the, the social interactions that you would get when you have online interaction and what would be the consequence of, of not compensating for that? And so, you know, obviously there's going to be a hybrid and it's how do you arrive at that hybrid and how do you strategize and make sure that you're hitting the right points when you're supposed to hit them, um, you know, without becoming despondent and throwing up your hands in the air. So, so you know, in, in going forward, just we just need to prioritize what those policies are going to be and, and tick them off as we go down the road, um, instead of trying to do so many things all at one time and achieving them. Thanks. All right, thank you, Captain. So I'm going to look at, I've been listening and taking some notes, um, and it seems like there's, there's quite a bit of alignment in this, in this panel. Um, I'm looking at it in terms of the now and future and I think what I'm hearing from the right right now is that um, the digital economy is like a no it's critical whether it is looking at um, e-learning whether it's looking at um, or financial systems and how we can make um, we can do things in a more efficient manner using technology whether it is um, just in terms of how government works and not having to go to the tax office for some issues but that is a no the digital experience and the digital economy is a no education was coming up exceptionally high in all of this and looking at a different kind of education because that is no um, we are going to have to go back in september and we need to look at what does that look like and what we're saying is that what i'm hearing is that there is a hybrid of the traditional learning plus using e-learning plus as um, we also hear, um, from, we heard from Faye, looking back at the use of mass media, um, where people have even more um, access to, they may not always have access to the Wi-Fi or, or predictable Wi-Fi, but you know, in many instances, they are able to hear the radio and, and, and possibly the, the television. And I hear Mina agreeing that the, the digital technologies and utilizing those, and we're seeing more of that, and that has to be accelerated if we are going to become more resilient for the now, and that also links to the future. So I have digital, I have education as short-term goals, and I was picking up a lot on leadership in terms of the short-term and that whole of government type approach using all the elements and having them work together also with civil society and bringing in all of the the players together um in relation to that um and then i'm hearing some more longer term things 
with um, diversification, um, looking at how we create that enabling environment so that someone who wants to innovate and do something different, a young person or an older person who wants to innovate can do that. There was the question of picking winners. Do we pick winners versus do we just create the enable, enabling environment? It's probably a, a hybrid of the two, but what I see a lot, I see a lot of young people with lovely ideas, no capital, access to capital. Capital is concentrated in particular hands. And that's something that we have to look at if we're really serious about growing the economy, because the bigger your economy is, the healthier your economy is, is the more resilient you are. And I'm hearing a lot about productivity, which links back to R&D and, and, and um, education too, and also, the kind of social interventions on crime and so on that we heard in the panels that were so good, the panel yesterday was so good, um, that are also necessary in terms of policies and building out um, resilience. Um, Mina, I heard you saying in seeing, I see you here talking about we, we should reach out to the World Bank for similar loans granted to EC countries. There is actually a Jamaica resilience loan that the World Bank has. I think it's sometime earlier this year that we got a loan that looked at resilience, looked at it both on the fiscal side and also on climate change. But there are other dimensions that we've discussed here that I think are important that we write up and, and put that into the mix. Now, please let me know if I've left every, anything out in terms of policy or you want us to extrapolate a bit more. And remember, all of this is going to be, be written up. Um, so is there anything I've I've left out from this conversation. I think this is something that could go on for the whole day, um, but I know they have time restrictions for us. Yeah, I think the the thing on the the politics, I think, is that um, where we can bring bring teams together. We have a working committee on crime, and I, I think that is the kind of you know engagement we want. So I mean, Omar, just to say that there, it it really just has to be an inclusive opportunity. At the community level is probably the only thing I would add, Dana, that we have to enforce what's happening at community level, which means the constituency development fund is critical. Um, they got cash, we need more of that. There are our eyes and ears to know what's happening at the community level. When you think about so many people who are jobless, we will know what's happening and how they can be used, how they can be put into having more uh, en engagement in agriculture, um, how we can get them having internet in schools at the most remote location, so they have a big role to play in terms of the political representatives, but but keeping us together, not divided. I think that was really the only point I probably want to add to clarify. Okay. Is there anything anyone else wants to add? We're at 220. Hey, this is Mina Dana. I just like to say um, to add to Lisa's comment just now. Um, the issue is that we're going into, whether we want or not, into an election phase. We're going into a period, and this is when we can't forget what else is happening. And the whole digitization, the whole digital economy is critical as we look at online, distance learning, um, to get the whole economy, giving them access. Access is so critical at this stage. So the, the, the issue of having many task force committees is critical right now so we don't lose sight of what's important for growth job creation and for for resilience as we go into this political period all right i i agree with you and, and i think there was an economic recovery task force that that primarily was focusing on covid and um elements around opening back the economy i think that you need that kind of high level mix of civil society and government coming together, as you say, it may not, um, in these mini task force. And it's something that we need to put on the table because this is a moment that we can either go up or we can continue or go down. Um, COVID is an opportunity. There are opportunities here. And the question is, what picture? I mean, face at it beautifully. We need to, to create a new picture. What does that new picture for Jamaica look like? And how are we, all of us here and other people with, with interest and with knowledge of, of economies and society and so on, how do we help to create that new vision of Jamaica that we want to see? 
and and it is something that we have to agitate for and put squarely on the table you know dana you said that we could spend the whole day here and that's true but it just seems to me there's one element that we may need to pull into this and this is about parents and we spoke about community development in one way but as we shift in our educating and as we shift in how we teach how we learn we we can't do that without involving parents and yesterday herbert gail gave a most exhilarating and yet a most frightening picture of the statistics of family and the role of both fathers and mothers in fact you know he kind of put to note this notion that crime especially among youngsters was, was a man thing no father at home when we saw it you heard it we saw that the majority the, 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 the percentage of missing mothers was actually even more frightening than we thought of so as we think about ways in which we try to address this whole aspect of the, the, the shift in the paradigm of teaching and learning we must have a, a deliberate strategy to engage parents because they have to be part of that dialogue and that transformation yes i i, I agree with you and those social interventions his his i agree lisa too in the chat we need to get that message out more he's been saying it a lot but i don't know if it's landed enough in relation to the, the crisis that we were in. You know, we were talking about education. How do you educate people when, based on his studies, the high percentage of our boys who are hungry in a constant state of hunger? Um, it's the these social interventions are absolutely necessary and they link back to crime, which is a big problem in our country. Um, and it links back to the kind of economic growth that we want to see. It's so interconnected. And so these issues of um, of parenting and other societal problems that we have and cultural issues too, that we need to confront, have to be put on the table too, or else none of this is going to take place. You can diversify as much as we want and throw as much money into sectors as we want, but we're not going to get to see the outcomes that we want if we don't look on people. Um, it's people, individuals who make up a society and make up an economy. And we have to place a lot of emphasis on the well-being of people um i'm not i think we are we are out of time and um there is a plenary that's coming up that i think we should all be a part of not sure how it's going to work but um i want to really thank all of you you've been really really a good team coming up with some ideas and they're concrete ideas that you've all articulated all i was doing was writing know what you were all saying um lisa thank you very much for the presentation um captain thank you for steering us in the directions that you you did and to all of the individuals who wrote in or sent through um who wrote their comments in or or intervened in other ways thank you very much and thanks to the jdf for organizing all of this we need more of these types of discussions to create that that new picture of Jamaica that we want to see. So thank you. Um, thank you all and see you in the, the plenary soon.